Trump and not cooperate. Wesley and John not cooperate. Wesley, good evening. Good evening. Always the Wesley. Always. We're usually allowed to sleep for the first half hour. Yeah. We can usually sleep for the first half hour. Yeah. Well, that's the difference between a Wesley and a good loser. Yeah. Baptist. You sleep on me. Baptist. Oh, that's right. <laughs> the Baptists sleep the second half hour. <laughs> okay, I, I wanted to share with you. Uh, you got notes on the way in. You have a copy of the slides we're going to use tonight. Uh, the slides tonight really, to me, constitute the heart of what we've been talking about. First two weeks we talked about who Jesus is. And we have to proclaim and confess that Jesus is Lord. Lord. And the message then is how do we share that with others? And that's what we're going to do tonight. And next week I'm going to give you materials that you can use to, to help share in that message. But with that being said, handed out also was this little two-page uh, listing of the life of Jesus. So uh, you can use that at your own leisure. You can see I did it because it's not as well done as uh, uh, they do here at Muncie Baptist. Now, Muncie Baptist, as much as you know, they want to say that I'm a Baptist, look what they've done. They, they encased me. <laughs> do not cross. They have to do not do not cross. Do not cross. So those who are watching on the web, good luck with that. We want to see you. <laughs> we want to see you. Yeah, I, I don't know why. Okay. But I want to ask you first one, tell me tell me what my button says. <laughs> Are you not allowed to cross? Right here, I'm going to go here. Michelle, you have to go on. Tell me your story. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. But since you gave such a wonderful answer, there you go. Let's have a word of prayer before we begin. Heavenly Father, we thank you for everyone who is here tonight and has once again committed their time. We pray, O oh Lord, that your spirit will speak to us and help us to grow. Help us to learn how to listen, to listen to you, to listen to others, and to listen to the spirit. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, as you can see, we continue tonight with the care community. And this is what Lou Holt said. You remember Lou Holt? Right. Any Notre Dame football fan? Well, this is Lou's point. Never tell your problems to anyone. Twenty percent don't care, and the other eighty percent are glad you have it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, in some ways uh, there's some truisms in that. But what we want to talk about tonight is how do we feel emotional and spiritual? Because I think this also underlines that fact. Never tell your problems to anyone. Can some of you resonate with that? You have some burdens, you have some issues, you have some problems, but you really don't want to share them because you think there's the 80% who just don't care to have it. And we're going to see how that comes into play even for us as Christians, when we're talking about how we need to be a witness. So where does it all begin? Well, I think it begins with this, at Psalm 8.4. What is man that you are mindful of him? And is son of man that you can care for him? Now, when you look at this in the Hebrew, it's the son of Adam, meaning the son of Adam, going into the Son of Man. Now, looking clearly at this, it's a Hebrew idiom, which is simply saying who we are. Think about this. What is man? Well, think of the vastness of creation. Remember called Satan? 
the astronomer. And what was his opening line? There are billions and billions and billions of planets. At least that's how he saw creation. And it very well may be. But when I read this song, I think of that masterpiece. But what I also think of is the glory of God and what he has done in the vastness of his creation. What this psalm is telling me is that God is mindful of us. He is mindful of men, women, boys, girls. He is mindful of his creation because he cares for us. And what we want to do tonight is learn how we can better express our care for others. And the one way we can do that is learn how to listen and perhaps ask this question, found on the button. No more gifts given out. But what's on the button? Tell me your story. People are ready to share if they know that we care. And that is where we will be tonight. Now, Christian caregiving, when we think about it, Christian caregiving, first of all, we want to say this, it is distinctive. Now, what is distinctive about it? It's not too tough to figure it out. It is Well, I had prayer. It is. It is. Christian. Christian. What's distinctive about Christian caregiving? It's Christian. And that's an important element for us to realize. That if we are going to witness, we want to witness about what we believe Christ has done. That's why we spent two weeks talking about who Christ is. So we see distinctively it is Christian. Now, in my years in ministry, I've had opportunity for many counseling sessions. And I've had Pastor Steve, Pastor Rob, the same. Now, some of these counseling sessions I felt needed far more help than I could give to them. And what I want to do is I want to refer them. But when I wanted to refer to them, I had to make certain that who I was referring to them, referring them to, were Christian. Christian. Because Christian caregiving has to be done by Christians. And our caregiving has to be done with that solid base that we talked about, that we know Jesus Christ. And so Christian caregiving is distinct. It is Christian. It is, secondly, a way of life. Now, I want you to open your Bibles to Psalm 1. Thank okay. you. So, if you will, open your Bibles to Psalm 1. And then, uh, one of the pastors, look at Proverbs 4.23. But Psalm 1. This is a familiar psalm, I will take it for many of you. It's the very first psalm. And we read it. It acts as the basis of what the Psalter is all about. The Psalter is about how does one obtain wisdom? And so you have Psalms going through Proverbs and they talk about how does one gain wisdom? Here it is. I love this song. How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway with sinners or sit in the company of mockers. <clears throat> Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction, and he meditates on it day and night. He is like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears its fruit in its season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Now, notice what the joy is in these first three verses. I think it's progressive. The joy is the person who does not walk with. Yeah. And then the next point is they do not stand. Then the third is they do not sit. 
Now notice there's a progression in this. That if we wish to be wise in our Christian caregiving, we have to make sure we are distinctively walking with the Lord. And we have to be careful with the advice we give as Christians. That it should reflect who Jesus is. So we look at this whole point. The, the light that this person has is in God. And in God, that person will meditate. They will think about God. And for us, we have to continue to think about God so that we can then think about others. And I, I see that. And notice now we have the rest of the psalm. The wicked are what? Not like this. See, the psalmist is saying, here's our comparison. The wicked are not the righteous. The righteous should not be the wicked. And looking at this instead, they are like chaff. The wind blows it away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. And looking at this, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. But the way of the wicked leads to what? Yeah, our mind says ruin. But notice this, the two ways are consistent biblical theme. And here in the psalm, Psalm 1, it's opening up the psalm to remind us that we have choices to make. And the psalmist is calling us to walk, to stand, and to sit and meditate with Jesus. And Jesus Christ said it this way in John 14, 6. What was it? I am the way, one of the I am's we study. So Christian caregiving is distinctive. It is a way of life. And we must remember it is not easy. Sometimes we think it's easy, but it's never easy. I know I have found difficult times in sharing the gospel with others and their response to that. And I would bet Pastor, what's his name? Rob and Steve would say the same. How many of you shared the gospel with someone you found it difficult? I want to be certain that we understand that. But we can lessen the difficultiness if we will learn how we can deal with other people. God has called us to use our gifts to show that we care. And how important that is for us. So we need to show how we care in this way. Looking at this, why do we not show our care to others? Well, think of it this way. How many of us are concerned about showing our care because we're embarrassed? We're afraid we will somehow, you know, be turned around. Oops. Embarrassed. And we don't want to share the gospel because... We don't want to be put down, or we don't want to be shown up. We just afraid. How many of you can honestly say this? I do not witness as much as I should because I am worried that I will be about it. Say amen. 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 That's why you're here. That's why this is the heart. Give you some tools to help lessen that. But we've got to admit that we don't show our care because we're worried. We're be embarrassed. Some of us are very excessive in our caution. We, we don't want to share the gospel message because we feel it's an intrusion. Right? What are the three things you don't talk about at the Thanksgiving table? <laughs> and the turkey. Yeah, that's exactly right. Politics and religion. Things you avoid. There was this woman who was on a flight. <clears throat> And she was seated next to a Lutheran pastor who was wearing his collar. And she started to tell the pastor all, all about herself. She said, you know, I just had my appendix taken out. And she said, would you like to see the scar? And, you know, the pastor said, no thanks. She was talking about the difficulty she's had with her husband, who she felt was not very attentive to her. She was talking about the difficulty of her children, who was very responsive to her. And when the pastor had an opportunity to get a word in, he said, 
do you go to church anywhere? And she looked at me and she said, well, that's rather personal, isn't it? <laughs> well, sometimes we are that excessively cautious. Looking at that, we don't witness sometimes because we feel we don't have enough knowledge. Now, how many people, I think, in the church have said, we will share the gospel message because that's what we pay what? Our pastor to do. Now, we wonder why churches aren't growing. Well, churches aren't growing in one way simply because if we are dependent upon the pastors, we're all in trouble. Mm -hmm. But the pastors only have so much influence. But all of us, imagine the influence we have in this room tonight. Think of that. There's three pastors here. Okay? Uh, everyone else, you outnumber us. Imagine what could happen if we all went out saying we want to tell our story or listen to someone else's story. And we'll do that before we close tonight. But when we look at these things, we don't witness because we just fear. We just fear. And you know, who is the author of fear? Satan. Got a question for you. Well, God's word said the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Yeah. Take the flip side of that. I wonder how God feels about a Christian who lost fear to rule their life because they're their afraid of failure or whatever they else in life. You're right. Yeah. Of course, in the scripture, fear is is that respect of the Lord, mm -hmm. and we we take fear as an emotional condition at times. So what happens is if we try to witness and we have been, if you will, shot down either <laughs> kindly or not so kindly. Well, when we begin to say to ourselves, gee, we better not try that again. So we say, well, let someone else try. But it is important for us to get over our fear and replace that with faith. And for our faith has to be rooted in Jesus Christ. And Christ said, if you will go and share my witness, I will give you the words to say. And I can tell you, that is exactly how it happened. How many of you have done public speaking? Any public speaking? Okay. Well, when you first do it, what happens? You're pretty fearful. But as you go on and do it, and as you learn to trust in the Lord, you find out that there are times he does give you the words to say. When I'm listening to Pastor Rice every Sunday, I'm saying, Lord, give him words to say. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> the reality is, God will help you if you are willing to reach out in faith. That's what witnessing is about, isn't it? I'm going to ask you to think about that tonight. Who are those individuals you can think of that you should be sharing the gospel message with? You know, they may be in your family, they may be your friends. They may be acquaintances. Uh, you know, there's a whole plethora of choices. But pray that God will direct you. You cannot witness without first being a person of prayer. That, that's where we get our strength. Then when we pray, God, I know, will provide an opportunity. And when he does, he will take away our fear and fill us with faith and give us the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because we're going to talk about Jesus. Don't talk about religion. Don't talk about politics. Talk about Jesus. Tell them what Jesus means to you. And you'll be surprised how the doors begin to open. But as soon as we stop, talk about church, <laughs> things become a little difficult, don't they? You know, people aren't willing to talk about church as much as they are willing to talk about a relationship. <laughs> and many times we don't win this because we, you know, we just don't see it for ourselves. It's, it's not a part of who we are. But I can tell you that if you wish to be a witness for Jesus Christ, he will provide the opportunity. And he will give you a way to share it. And I hope the next time the Spirit really speaks to you, you will say, yes, Lord, give me the words. 
and share the message of Jesus with someone else. Okay? Because that's what this is all about. The first two weeks were pretty good for us. But this week it really gets a little different. And so we have to learn these things. Psalm 8, 4, what is man that you are mindful of him? And remember that word, thank you, what? Care for him. How wonderful that is. Think of it. God's love from heaven to earth. God to man. Creator to the creator. Yet he is mindful of each of us. And then we have Proverbs 29, 7. A righteous man knows the rights of the poor. A wicked man does not understand such knowledge. Well, what is this saying? It's saying that the righteous, meaning those of us who are right with Jesus, should care for the poor. That is one way we witness, isn't it? I know both of the churches are involved with the community. And we need to be involved with community. Sunlight House, Coke giveaways, <laughs> all sorts of things. But we do that to share the message of Jesus. But when we do these social action things, we should also share the word with those that we are helping. So not only do we want to give them a Coke, we want to share the message of Jesus. And now I know that that's pretty difficult. Because when we did Coke giveaways at St. Andrews, uh, Kathy was telling the people came in, boom, you know, like locusts. You know, and they wanted the coats and everything. And we weren't equipped enough to talk to them about Jesus. And I thought, you know, this is a missed opportunity. And so when we are working with the poor, we should also be ready to share the word as God has with us. And it's an important element. When you turn to Luke 10, 29 through 37, this is going to sound familiar. Luke 10, 29 through 37, half of rice, he loves reading, so he'll, he'll take care of that for us. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and he gave them to the innkeeper saying, Take care of him and whatever more you spend I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. Okay, so this is the story of the Good Samaritan. It's really ingrained in us, isn't it? We, we know it. But what's so interesting about this is this Samaritan saw this poor, beaten man. And what was his first feeling? If you look at it carefully, he sees this poor, beaten man. And his first feeling is compassion. That's the word. So it's underlined to circle. He had compassion. Now, you can hear this from your pastors in the sermon some Sunday. I just want to highlight the fact that it all begins with compassion. Tony Campolo years ago said it this way. Do we give a damn that someone's going to hell? The lack of our compassion is some of us here are more concerned, I said, damn, than people going to hell. Compassion has to move us and witnessing to 
be a willing witness has to begin with the compassion that people are being lost for eternity. And some of them are your family. Some of them are your friends. Some of them are your acquaintances. Some of them are your co-workers. Some of them are the people who are seated with you perhaps in the very same view. And we have to ask ourselves, what will we do? And it begins with compassion. It begins with a heart that cares. And the hearts that care are hearts that the Holy Spirit can use. And so we begin with this type of compassion. So now he has compassion. And then he wants have compassion. You, we feel that, yes, he's making sense. There are people who are lost. And we don't want them to be lost. Is there an amen to that? Amen. Now notice what he does best after he is moved with his compassion. What does he do? Compassion moves into an action. He went to him. He went to him. Now the story unfolds because the other guys, they didn't go there. They passed over because they had other things to do. But compassion comes to us in such a way that we are able to put aside our agenda to help those who are in need. And that's why we need to be about and willing witness. We need to share this gospel message. So he went to him. Not only did he went, go to him, but he then what? Helped him. Bound up the wounds and did all of these things. And that's a wonderful thing. And that's what we need to do. Witnessing is like that. We begin with compassion and we go. Jesus said, go. Go into the world. He didn't say, let the world come to you. He said, you go into the world. Now, we can't go into the entire world, but certainly we have circles of influence. And those are those people that we should be praying for. If not, we have no way to begin our witnessing. So maybe you want to note it down. Note it down, a piece of paper, some people you want to witness to. Or you want others to witness to, for that matter. And you can begin to pray for them, right? You are moved by compassion to go to them, to move out of your comfort zone, and to help them. And what I love about this is not only did he do all of these things, but this is where the church falls and falls. In the story, he followed up. Notice at the end of the story, what does what, he say to the innkeeper? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you know, I'll pay for whatever else you may need. He followed up. And in the life of the church, that seems a little difficult for us, doesn't it? I've seen it in my own church at St. Andrew. I've seen it in Muncie Baptist. And I believe it's probably true at Pleasant Hill. People come in, and we fail to follow up. And not only do they come in the front door, but soon they learn to leave the back door. Witnessing needs to begin with a compassion. Then the next step is for us to go, then to help, then to most of all follow up. And underline verse 37. What did Jesus say? He said, go and do likewise. During Lent, I like to watch the passion of the Christ, and the stories of Jesus during Lent. I don't know if any of you like to do the same. But I found something on Netflix. It was the Gospel of John. And it was well done. It was well done. But this came up, and I thought it was significant. The story is with Jesus and Simon, Simon Peter. And he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, why? And my sweet. Now, isn't this interesting that as we look at this, 
He said, take my sheep. In John 21, 15, the verse right before this, Jesus said to Peter, feed my lambs. This verse, he says, what? Tend my sheep. And then the following verse, 17, feed my sheep. Notice once again there's a progression going on here that, that Jesus is saying to Simon Peter. It's not enough for you to simply say, I love my sheep. You've got to do something about it. And it's not enough for us to simply sit in the pews and say, we have a story to tell to the nation and never tell it. We are called to go out, be the Good Samaritan, willing witnesses, and also then to feed the sheep. So they know that they are cared for. Now this, this my friends, is the ministry of your pastor. It is to feed the sheep. And I'll tell you, sheep stink. Sheep are ornery. Sheep are not easily led. It's not the pastoral pictures you see. Sheep have their own personalities and they're a stubborn little bunch. But pastors are called to what? Shepherd, shepherd the flock, as we'll see in a moment. But we see in Timothy, if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? And that's why pastors have to be people who can indeed manage their own household. So I'm speaking to the three of us, or primarily to the two of you, but I understand, and I want you to understand, being a pastor isn't as easy as you think. It isn't just waking up Sunday morning at 8 and saying, well, I think come up with a sermon, come up with a sermon, lead the church service, go home, have lunch, and wait for the following Sunday. No. There's a lot of stuff going on day in and day out. And this is a call that has to come from God. I am always suspicious when a pastor tells me they chose, uh, they didn't choose the ministry, it was just something that was available. I want pastors to tell me that God chose them to go into the ministry. That was a call. It was a call. And that's how important it is. So we look at that. And what does Peter tell me? Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not, not under compulsion. So, you know, we're looking at this, and all of these things, that we are to shepherd the flock. Now, it's interesting, the shepherds would walk in front of the flock. We, we have a picture, we have a picture that the flock, you know, was uh, bought, would be in front of the shepherd. But no, the shepherd had a lead sheep, and the flock would follow the lead sheep, and thus following the shepherd. And isn't that true in some ways? How many of you have been in your churches a long time? <coughs> have, who's been in church more than 30 years? <coughs> your church, okay? Have you seen a variety of pastors in 30 years? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> isn't it true that when a pastor comes in, I believe this is true, that the church will take on some tendency of the current path. Isn't it? I think it, it is true. If you're not going to answer it, I'll answer it. If I answer the question, I'll answer it. But I think it's true. And that's why it's important for the shepherds of the flock to exercise an oversight. And pastors should lead the church. Don't follow the church. You have to lead the church. And those of us who want to be willing witnesses are going to learn. We need to also lead. We just can't follow. Witnessing happens when we make it happen in church. And that creates someone. And I'm going to say something that going to upset some of you, but here it is. <coughs> Sending a car is not fully witnessing. It just simply isn't. 
And I have from the very first experience, my daughter, who's attended here, got a card which simply said, well, we miss seeing you around, and we hope in 2019 that you'll show up more. Well, the thing is, she's been showing up every week. Now, I am certain whoever sent that card meant it in the best of intention. But how do you think it was received? Not very good is the answer. You know, she was offended. She's coming here, and then she told, you know, hope to see you more. And it's an interesting secondary story to this, which we will not go into. But sending cards isn't just the answer. What we need to do is we need to go and be the witness. Okay, and to do that, we have to learn some things, and time's running out. So, Monday back is a pleasant view. Okay, how should we show our care for others? Well, how do you do it in Pleasanton? What, what, what's your great witnessing technique there? I'll get back to that. How do you do that once you backwards? We oh. greet, we greet those who come in. We try to make contact with everyone that is not a regular. Um, Make them feel like they're welcome. We do miss a few. We do mess up at times. But that is what we try to do, I believe. Okay. Uh, as of you, we uh, also do uh, dinners to those that are, uh, you know, might be going through a hard time. People who have had uh, maybe deaths in the family or you know, things like that. We also go out and visit those people at their homes and uh, just show them care by showing up and letting them know we're praying for them. Okay. So let's not confuse care with even a witness for evangelism. Okay, that, that's a little different. Yeah. That's different. Okay, and even here at Monday Baptist, we got great care. There's no doubt. And this care begins with both of these guys who are both caring pastors. And that, that is something you should be thankful for for whichever church you're attending. Okay? But looking at all of that, we are talking about how do we formulate a witness. Now, here's, here's what I want to get to. We need to become active listeners. The greatest barrier to effective active listening is the urge to what? Talk to you. Talk to us. Now, I'm talking now about active listening. So I'm going to give you these points because we've got to move on. But the first point of active listening is to thank you. And what is the distinction of Christian caregiving? I'll help you. That's it. I just wanted to review it. Okay, looking at that. Two points for me. You made that one. Okay, your, your pastor will give you the party gift. Um, <laughs> looking, looking at that, what I want to say is that here we have to learn to listen. Do some of you have a difficult time with that? Now, just because you're quiet when someone's talking doesn't necessarily mean you're listening. Because the word there is active. And that, that, that's what we're going to hone a little bit into here. Okay? Active listening requires that you learn the art of silence. Silence is golden. <laughs> and how true it is. But for some of us, it's a difficult time. When there's conversation and there's a wall, some of us, <laughs> we don't like that silent part. So we begin to talk. And maybe we should be really listening. Now, to be an active listener, you have to practice. When practicing this skill, you can begin by forcing yourself to be silent in places where you might normally be a very talkative person. Where are those places that you might be a talkative person? Work. <clears throat> Work. Okay. 
And all these ways? Bible study. Yeah, Bible study. Shame <laughs> like on you. Yeah. How about even at, at home? home? Huh? At home. But how about even at church? Yes. You know? But I love a lot of churches because, you know, whenever the uh, praise is going, everyone's going, you know, you, you hear that. And sometimes the organist, pianist, will try to play louder. And then the people talk about it. You know, <laughs> that, you know that, that type of thing. Or even in the auditory, sometimes there's people, you know, we, silence is a little scary for us. But we have to learn to practice active listening by forcing ourselves to actually listen. And that's a difficult thing. So we named some of those places. Now, what are we to judge? Well, let's look at this one. Another obstacle to active listening is prejudging the person. Uh, we many times see someone and all of a sudden we come up with some sort of judgment, don't we? I, I don't know how it happens. Someone will have to explain to me all the synapses in the brain. But you know, if they don't look exactly like us and talk a little bit like us, all of a sudden we kind of Go arm's length. So what, what John said is true in the church, but what I've experienced in churches is that some of the most difficult times to really listen to someone else is following the service at fellowship time. If you notice, we like to hang around with the people we what? Like to hang around. So what happens is we form this circle, and every Sunday you have your circle at the church. And what is difficult is when the visitors come, and even though you may hand them a book, and you may say, welcome to Pleasant View of Muncie Baptist, until we allow them to truly enter and listen to them, they have not been welcomed. And this happens within the first 30 seconds when they're walking in the door. What we need are not so much greeters and ushers, we need good active listeners encouraging people to tell them their story. That's where it begins. Tell the story. What brought you to Pleasant? What brought you to Monty Night? What can we do for you? What, you know, I'm not a ghost. But these are important things because when people feel they are not involved, it's sad. I went to a church, uh, Mount Bethel, Lutheran Brethren Church, and Cindy was the organist there. And uh, following the service, the people would talk. And this was a, a very literal, figurative uh, placement. There were the circles, and they were talking in these circles. And I was trying to get in to talk in one of these circles, and guess what? They wouldn't let me in. I was not their guy, you know? And now I, I've left uh, the church I pastored in McAllisterville. And I'm a pastor, I'm still not living the circles. And I, that feeling has never left. And I hope that a pleasant view in Muncie Baptist. The one thing you can see is when the stranger comes in, make a circle for that somehow. I'm sure if it's still because here, you know, she here's like McCabe what he's talking about. But I go online and I, I see links and I find I, I'm interested, my wife don't know why, maybe it's because something to me, of people commit suicide, okay? And this one woman committed suicide, she's only about maybe 20 some years old, and she was different, you can tell by looking at her, she was different, you know, she had her yeah. piercing stuff like this there. But she committed suicide, she left a suicide note, a long note, to tell people that she's sorry, she couldn't have life anymore. But at the very end of that suicide, she note, she put big letters, please, judge less and love more. Yeah. How much? I mean, that's actually the uh, human uh, frailty for a human being is to look at someone and the first thing you want to do is judge them. You don't, know, are you saying talk about compassion? If you, if we judge them, like, where's our compassion there? Mm -hmm. Well, compassion has never killed anybody. So, <laughs> so the church can never be too compassionate. But the reality is, I'm going to say something again, make you think. What we call compassion sometimes is just our own ecclesiastical convenience. 
And people outside the church do not feel it. And if we are to grow, we have to make entrance points for people to come in and feel that they belong in the circle. And and, I, and we, we have a story here. It was a, a sad story. Uh, I didn't ask the pastor about it. Anyway. We, we, we had a young woman who came in worship service. I, I talked to her at the worship service and everything. And uh, we, I welcomed her here. I talked to her a little bit about Jesus. And uh, this is a good place to find Jesus. And, I, and uh, she was so thankful. We had a congregational meeting. I don't know if you remember. She, she came downstairs to the congregational meeting, sat at the table, and she was all by herself. Now, I'm part to blame for this. I am part to blame. I'm, I'm taking the blame. I, I knew as soon as I saw by myself that something should have been done, but our family was together and everything like that. And uh, I, I just I kind of smiled at her, but I didn't do anything. And she sat there, she had a meal, <laughs> left, and never returned. You know, now that's where I was at, at error. But at the same time, I wasn't the only one down there. You know, so it's all of our businesses to be witnessed. Right. And I think it points out, too, that sometimes, a lot of times, we always assume that somebody else is going to do it. And that, we shouldn't do that. When we feel led by the Spirit to speak to someone or talk to someone, we should do it, not just think, Oh, the pastor's going to do it, or Pastor Don's going to do it, or somebody else, one of the ushers. When we feel that call, we should do it. And just a quick story, you know, I was just talking about um, uh, Lou Bogart, who just passed away. Uh, a couple of people in our church shared that he was so intent on making people feel welcome that he would go went out of his way to welcome some people to our church, uh, Carol and Sally. They, they were going out the door. He followed him out the door. I just was concerned. I saw nobody talk to you. I just wanted to talk to you, tell you a little bit about the church. And so that that's what we need to do, not just look and say, well, that's Andy's job or John's job. When we feel led, we need to do it. Exactly right. And here's the other thing I've learned over all my years of ministry, and we'll put this in the category of pastoral wisdom. A lot of, a lot of lay people... Just say, well, the pastor said hello to me, but that's their job. That's their job. That's how a lot of lay people feel. But it's, yeah, but they feel a lot better if you go up to them and say, thank you for being with us at Muncie Baptist or our one long Lutheran of the evening, St. Andrew Lutheran. You know, people, people feel that connectedness with other people. And the pastors, they see as being paid to do that. Or they see the pastor as just doing that to gain another member. We're looking at that. So looking at this, what sometimes it's a prejudice thing. We we don't want to and what you said, you know, about that young girl. How sad <clears throat> we do that. You know, we, but we are prejudicial people in the world. And as Christians, we should be just well, and I think one of the things that we, I'm guilty at times, uh, Pastor, or not being an active listener because I hear maybe I maybe I come to a farm with a little bit of information, possibly, but after I hear a few things, I, I I'm in my mind like, okay, I think I know where this is going. And I'm already like moving ahead, like, okay, this is what I'm going to offer up to them. This is why I'm like, I'm not listening anymore. You see what I'm saying? I'm, I'm moving ahead of them, whether it's because I want to move this along or whatever the case may be. And, and, I'm, and to me, that could even possibly come under the prejudge category because I'm trying to come up with a solution or an answer or whatever instead of just remaining engaged in what they're sharing. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. How, how true that all is. And uh, we have to be cognizant of that and be careful that we don't do that. It, you know, it's like, how many of you get these robo calls? Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you by chance get a live person calling you, they don't want to spend the time asking you how you're doing. <clears throat> they want to go through their script. And that's what you were talking about. I, I got a script. But to be an active listener is for us to turn the script around and pay more attention and focus more on the other person than our own agenda. 
So let's look at some of these. Seven active listening steps. If you want to be an active listener, look at the person and suspend other things you are doing. It's, it's pretty difficult to talk to someone when they're looking away from them. Right? It may, look at that person. Well, you start looking at them and all their mess and not paying attention to them anymore. Oh boy. Oh boy. Oh boy. <laughs> True enough. Listen not merely with the words, but the feeling that it, they're expressing. When people share conversations, they express a feeling in that. That young lady, how sad, <clears throat> the end of that story. But I'm sure she was expressing a feeling all along the way. But she didn't come to the point of understanding that people felt that for her. There was a lack of empathy received on her part. Be sincerely interested in what another person is talking about. Now, that's tough because Sometimes we have our own agendas going on, don't we? We have places to be, people to be. But we don't want to listen. You know, another thing too, I think, is um, the eye contact. We're getting there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, so okay. what do you think that? But how, how true it is, you know? And see, in some cases, we even want to rush the teaching agenda. Look, looking at these things, continuing with all of this, restate what the person said. Th that's important. <clears throat> and I, I hope that you take these home and really look at them carefully. But restate what the person said. It's simply done this way. If I hear you, <laughs> this is what you said. Yeah, you know, if the person says, to you coming into church, I feel rotten. And the response is, well, the Lord's not going to give you more than you can have. Well, yeah, we know that to be true. But active listening, reflective listening, is what at that point? Someone says, I feel rotten. I'm sorry to hear that. What's going on? Why do you feel rotten? Yeah, you, you want to restate it. You want to restate it. Well, what is happening? What makes you feel so bad? You know, you want to begin, you want to begin giving them this emotional contact as well as it. You want to ask clarification questions sometimes and act the listening. You know, why why do you feel that way? What what has happened to make you feel that way? And all of these things help us to grow deeper and deeper in our conversations. Be aware of your own feelings and opinions. Sometimes the reason we don't want to listen is because we don't believe what the other person is saying because we are so prejudiced in our own opinions. To be an active listener, we've got to give of ourselves to the other person. And that's tough. Any uh, married men here? You tried that with your wife lately? That is tough. And when I was a young man, when I would do so brilliantly with Cindy, was when we were getting in a little, let us say, tip, because pastors and pastors' wives never fight, right? Just gentle little tips. So I would say to Cindy, well, if I hear what you're saying, uh, this is uh, what you are uh, sharing with me. And I would go almost objective counseling into this act of listening thing. And uh, tell everyone how that worked out for me. <laughs> so, what I'm saying is, if we are prejudicial in listening, and if we fail to share with other people what they are sharing, but want to interject our own opinion, we won't hear what they're saying. Well, and you said the distinctive is Christian. We come to the conversation, I'm right, because I've got the gospel of Christ on my side, and we may indeed be right. Yes. But it can be a hindrance to active listening, and we're not willing to hear what you're doing. Sure. You, you can be so right, you can be wrong. Yeah. And that's, that's an important element for us in our witness. Witnessing like this doesn't happen in a 10 minute conversation. This is something that develops over a period of time. But when it develops, this is when we can make disciples. Making a disciple just isn't. A symbol or formula of a magic. And we need to state our views 
only after we listen. So here's some verbal signals. Okay, I'm listening clues. Every once in a while, people want to know that you are listening, that you haven't zoned out. And I'm, sometimes, yeah. Have you ever been in conversations where you zone out? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and so forth. That, that's not helpful at all. <clears throat> we want to just close some things. Every once in a while, we might say, well, after I've heard what you said, this is what has happened to me. But that's only secondary. That's not the first. And I've heard many a conversation in the life of the church where someone begins to disclose something and someone shuts it down right away to give their own opinion. And that we aren't helpful that way. We want to make validating statements, assuring the person that they're not completely off the rail. Because everyone wants to feel that they are loved and they are significant. And looking at that. And we mirror the statements. That is simply saying, well, I'm right here. Here's our nonverbal. I told you it was coming. Okay? Good eye contact. Now, not a strict eye contact because they'll think you're psychopathic. <laughs> <laughs> now, but a good eye contact. And don't you know it to be true? In your own time of conversation, haven't you looked at the other person to see if they were looking at you? Because that's a sign of validation. Facial expressions. When when someone is telling you something that you know may be shocking, don't go, oh! <laughs> <laughs> they may be I'm like, hey, they're not ready to hear what I want to say. But facial expressions are important. Smile a little bit. You know. Let the person know that you really care to be with them at that moment of time. You're not going to marry them, most likely. But for that moment of time, let them feel that this is important and significant. Body language. All of our communications roots in some way in body language, right? Yeah. I mean, when, when I move forward, what do you think I'm trying to say body language like? I want your attention as a teacher, let's put that. So I'm moving forward. I'm, I'm trying to envelop, envelop the whole group. Okay, if I, if I see someone at the table over here, the Wesleyan table like this. Me. Yeah, what, yeah. what, what do you think? I have to have my photo on that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you don't know how to define it. But you realize it's something that's being done. If, if I'm here like this, and I start going, you know, it's like I'm disassociating, you know. Look at body language. It's so important. And you can tell what's happening. Some of you are very relaxed in your body language. And some of you are saying it's almost 8 o'clock. Thank God. Just so that it gets your, your body language. But, but looking at these things, it's all important. And silence. Remember, we began by saying, if you really want to be an active listener, do what? Listen! Allow silence to be gone. And that's important. And then, every once in a while, a gentle touch. i got to be careful with that. But, you know, a gentle touch. Because people feel secure. As long as you're not stepping on their imposed boundaries. But a gentle touch means something. Okay. So what are our lessons that we learned? Well, let's see. Work hard to give your complete attention to the person you are communicating with. Active listening is hard work. Hard work. Don't leave here without thinking that. Avoid jumping to conclusions. Listen for how something is said. How something is said. And listen for what is not said. And there's a plenty of story to go on. And do not overact with what is said. And give the communicator a chance. More lessons learned very quickly. Look for nonverbal signs in the message. And nonverbal signs. You know, it's their body language. If, if you begin to talk about Jesus, 
He said, you know, I go to Muncie Baptist Church. I go to Pleasant View. Jesus is really alive and well here. And you see someone starting to go like this. <laughs> what, what, what I'm saying? What? Yeah. They say back off. So back off. You love it. Well, I can't do it big. No, no. Leave your emotions and prejudices behind. How important that is. Give the communicator eye contact. All of these things are important. But most of all, stop talking. And listen. And you'll be surprised what you might learn. And as you listen in the midst of this, that's when the Holy Spirit speaks to you. So that when you have a chance to speak, you'll have the proper words to say. Not reaching out in fear, but reaching out in faith. So, looking at those things. Now, you, you have in, in your chart uh, the three circles, right? Mm-hmm. There they are. Okay. Now, I, I want you to realize this. Tell me your story. That's where it begins. How many of you have a story to tell about how you came to Jesus? Okay. Everyone. Right? I think everyone has a story here. Would I be correct in assuming that? Yeah. Your story is as important and as significant as anyone else's story. Sometimes what we are confused in witnessing is event versus process. Some people can tell the story of how they came to Jesus Christ. I came to Jesus Christ because I was a punk in New York. Now I'm just an old punk. (laughs) But I was in a gang. And in our gang, on 8th Avenue, we we thought we were tough turks. And so we would go to Sunset Park and we would cause trouble. As I grew up, I started to box in the police athletic league. And then this was my, my recreation. You realize in the city, we, we didn't have many ballparks, we didn't have football fields, high school didn't offer any of those things. So, so I started to box. And I thought I was proficient <clears throat> enough. And at times when we were in fights, I, I could hold my own. One night, Another gang kind of came into the park. They jumped us. <coughs> they jumped us. This is the They jumped us. And the four guys held me down. And one guy had those boots back in the day with the big heels. Mm-hmm. And he started to go like this on my face. Good feel. Mm-hmm. When they got done, all I could feel was the blood coming down. Went to the hospital, got stitches and all that. And I began to wonder. One one day in the high school was after a gym class in a, some sort of little Space. I was changing my clothes, and this came into my head. There's got to be more to life than just trying to beat up someone or getting beat up. <laughs> There's got to be more to life than just trying to prove how tough I am. And I said, Jesus, if you're real, come into my life. Now I I had gone to church. And all those things. But it was there I said something about Jesus coming into my life. Now, there were no stories written down that in Fort Hamilton High School, Don Edwards met Jesus. No, no flashing lights as I was riding my horse down 8th Avenue. No lightning. No voice from heaven. But it's my story. And I look at my life and I see where Jesus has helped me and changed me all along the way. It's been an event. It's been a process. That's my story. But I know that God 
had done something great. We don't have time really, to go around. But if you were to tell your story, we could see what God has done. Very quickly, they have to race. Come on. Well, I was raised in a Christian family. I wanted to come. You got me on screen, buddy. <laughs> in the box. In the box. I, I was raised in a Christian family. I mean, my parents. I think I went. I was born on a Sunday. I think the next Sunday I was in church. And I remember learning the Bible stories from my grandmother. And I don't have that specific day when I came to Christ, but I remember one day talking to my grandmother, and we went in her bedroom and kneeled together, and I accepted Jesus into my heart. And, you know, that became more serious for me as I grew up and as I uh, became a teenager. I felt the call of God on my life to, to go into ministry. I felt the call of God on my life to do more than just kind of go to church to have my faith be active and living. But for me, it was, it was I can't pinpoint the moment, but it was more of a, a process. And, and like you said, Pastor Don, Year by year, day by day, week by week, God's God's work on me, and, and I've grown in my faith. Mm -hmm. what, what did you hear from these two stories? Tell me what you heard. Hear the question. Basically, two opposites. Okay, how? How so? Pastor Rice is somewhat like <clears throat> myself who grew up in the church. Don't have a really specific time when I, mm -hmm. but was baptized. You, you had an event that all of a sudden made you think. <coughs> yeah, what and you can go back to that certain event. Yeah, well, what's an event though was my question because the process was already in me and so on. So you said you went to church. Yeah, yeah. I just didn't claim Jesus. I didn't have that. See, if you listen carefully to the story, that's one drastic difference. You prayed with your grandma. I, mean, I prayed with you in a stinky locker room. You know, so it could have been the dirty socks for all I know. But, you know, there, there was the point. But what is the similarity of the two stories? You heard the call. Okay? Yeah. There we go. Okay, so... What happens is the spirit is moving amongst us, right? This is why it's so significant. And remember this. Tell your story. Listen to the other person or my story. And most of all, formulate it all in his story. Because it's Jesus who worked in both of our lives. The work of the spirit. And it's Jesus who works when we want to witness. And you can tell a story. So it would be a good thing for you to kind of tell your story of how you came to Jesus or who Jesus is for you now, what he means. Because if you tell the story to someone else, they'll listen to your story, you'll listen to their story, and in the midst of that, the Holy Spirit is working. Does that make sense to you? And I think that's a very important element in regards to of being a willing witness. We don't want to hit the people in the head with the Bible. <clears throat> the Bible shouldn't be used as a club when we're telling our stories. It should be used as an invitational gateway of what God has done. Can you tie this into me for me for that first quote that you brought in? The 28? Yeah, no, I'm struggling with that quote, and I'm just trying to figure out why you have it. Yeah. To, to Lou Holt. Never sell your problems yeah. to anyone. Yeah, to Lou Holt. Yeah. 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 My time for well, that is that is really how the world thinks. Just the, okay. They're not Christians, but that's how the world thinks, and that's what makes it so difficult for us to it's tell like our story. And for them to trust us. Exactly. Their story. Yes. But we need to continue to tell stories. And wherever you are, you don't have to tell your whole story. Say you little something maybe of what Jesus has done. And it might be amazing what the Spirit will do with that little bit. Yeah, can I hear something? Sure. So, two, three weeks ago, I 
our 12 year old to a sleepover. And, you know, people ask, how long do I? Well, that is a loaded question. It was a very loaded answer. And then I actually am the person that feels guilty when I respond and tears come into my eyes. You know what I mean? Um, but so this woman, you know, says, no, we've been praying for him. I, I, I really don't know who she is from Adam besides, like, she knew my cousin, and now I'm meeting her through my kids. Well, she asked how I'm doing, and I gave her a really loaded answer, probably a TMI, but which is my personality. But <laughs> later on that night, I just sent her a message like, I just need to apologize. I am TMI. I said, but at the same point, you need to understand my character that I feel that we are bound to one another. Um, so him, when we make ourselves broken, like allow others to see the broken vulnerable pieces, mm -hmm. and otherwise everything is so comfortable and nothing mm -hmm. cracks that surface mm -hmm. to form those relationships. I said, but I do need to apologize if I shock you with my response because it was private and personal and real, you know? And here, which was fantastic, but she's another sister. And I, you know, so, I guess like a week later, she's like, this made me think of you, and she said, me a Bible words, you know what I mean? And it's like, just those little things about us that could be so quick could actually leave an impression where you're going to find someone that has your back as a warrior and on their knee for you, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, uh, it's, brokenness is good. Yeah. <laughs> it can be good. <laughs> Yeah, it's good to an extent. Well, we find those common bonds with right. people that we can help with. Yes, and what we want to get on to that is, you know, if, if that's part of your story, who knows how much the Lord can use for other broken people, and who will admit it as freely as you. My, the Lou Holtz thing is saying 80% of the people won't really want to admit they're broken. Which makes it really difficult. But what does the Bible say? Yeah. The Bible says what? We are all broken. Mm -hmm. yeah. We are all broken. And so that, but the witnessing component is difficult. All I am saying is, as we conclude tonight, is this. Think about people you believe need the gospel. Write the names down. Begin to pray for them. Allow God to work. Some of the worst times I've had in my life is when I moved before God. So when I'm saying, think of these people, write it down. God will provide opportunity. When those opportunities come, become an active listener. Do not be ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of salvation. Tell your story a little bit. And if they're not going to listen to the whole story, watch what this doing with their body language. Just say some of it. But uplift Jesus Christ. And you'll find, little by little, the Spirit will work. And the Spirit's working in the case that you just shared, mm -hmm. cases we share, and you know the Spirit's working in your life, isn't he? Okay. So no matter how young or how old you are, you have some stories to tell about Jesus. And I just want to Give me this injunction. Go and tell them. Next week, I'm going to give you materials that will help you to tell the story in a more specific sense. But tonight, the overall theme was look at the papers, how to be a better listener, and most of all, share your story with others so that you both hear his story. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity of being together tonight. And we pray, Father, that you will just help us in our witnessing. Lord, we are willing, but we know we are weak. So we trust in the power of the Holy Spirit, who will appoint the time for these witnesses, and he will give us the words to say. And we pray, Father, for your covering for Pleasant View Wesleyan Church, that you will strengthen her, and that you will guide her. We pray for Muncie Baptist Church that you will continue to help us to uplift you and to reach out into this community. We pray this in the blessed name 
of Jesus Christ our Lord, who was willing to die for us so that we could live for him. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.